A bomb in Market Hill provokes an angry response from the Loyalist Volunteer Force, but fails to derail the talks process. The timing of the attack and its location in the heart of Mid-Ulster suggests a concerted attempt to scupper the negotiations here at Stormont. Tonight we examine the paramilitary groupings opposed to the peace process. Later in the programme, we'll assess the LVF. But first, Justin O'Brien reports on the purpose of the Market Hill bomb. At 11.54 last Tuesday, the real dilemma facing the Republican movement came into clear focus. Jerry Adams suggested it was regrettable there were still people who didn't see the potential of what his party was trying to achieve at Stormont. But this was precisely what those responsible for the bomb wanted to highlight. It fits into a carefully planned pattern of actions by the Continuity Army Council and its political ally, Republican Sinn Féin. That strategy is designed in equal measure to humiliate the provisionals and destroy the talks. The negotiations are geared to strengthen and modernise British rule in Ireland. They are not geared towards the freedom of all Ireland. So you would not rule out the use of force during that negotiation period? The right of the Irish people to fight for the freedom still obtains. A day after the bomb and the Ulster Unionist Party entered the talks venue flanked by the representatives of Loyalist paramilitaries. The bombing had ensured that Sinn Féin was effectively sidelined. David Trimble suggested he was there to expose what he termed the Republican movement's fascist character. But Jerry Adams realises that failure to deliver could lead to a slippage of core support. The Unionists wrecked the first process. And they wrecked the first process because they are afraid of change. And they're still afraid of change. And their strategy is to wreck this process also. Forty-eight hours earlier, and it had been very different. Sinn Féin had been riding the crest of a propaganda wave, rallying the troops in central Belfast. The sacrifice of those who fought and died would not be forgotten. The core ideals would not be compromised. The keynote speakers were carefully chosen. Dick McFarlane, a key strategist of the 1981 hunger strike, standing alongside former Belfast IRA commander Martin Meehan and Jerry Kelly of Sinn Féin. If there had been no partition, if there had been no lines of apartheid, or no discrimination, or no injustice in the six occupied, occupied counties of Ireland, then there would be no men and women in jail. Conflict resolution demands that the causes and the system and the symptoms be resolved. Despite such stunts, the day of reckoning is fast approaching for the Republican movement. The question is whether these negotiations represent for the provisionals the final retreat from armed struggle in favour of the primacy of politics. To critics of the leadership, play acting in Belfast is no substitute to waging a war. And perhaps most damaging is that that analysis is now being put forward by former Republican prisoners with, in their terms, impeccable credentials. The present leadership of provisional Sinn Féin has uh, entered in onto a course which is at variance with the traditional understanding of republicanism insofar as they have entered into a process of negotiations which will at best, at best, lead to uh, an internal settlement within the northern six counties. Uh, a settlement which will not break the connection with Britain, which is one of the uh, principal objectives of republicanism in Ireland. Bundorn on the Donegal coast is just on the headland from where the IRA murdered Lord Mountbatten in 1979. It's a town steeped in republican thinking. It's also a power base for republican Sinn Féin. Commemoration parade, the 16th anniversary of the hunger strikers. For the past month, the party has been laying down a gauntlet to the provisionals, accusing them of reneging on the ideals of the movement. At a recent gathering, they issued the provisionals with a warning. The armed struggle would continue with 
or without them. They are being absorbed into the British system in Ireland. Uh, British policy in Ireland for hundreds of years has been very clear, and that is coercion, and when it suits, compromise. Uh, we've had the coercion, now they're engaged in compromise, and they hope to absorb a section of those who have been resisting them into their system uh, by bringing back a new stormant, by updating it and modernizing it and hoping to make it more acceptable to the world at large. And their plan is to get a section of the nationalist population helping them out in doing that. And that is exactly what the provisionals are doing at present. Rory O'Brody has a long Republican pedigree. A former president of Sinn Féin, he led a walkout in 1986 following a decision by the Adams and McGuinness leadership to recognise the Dublin Parliament. He predicted that in time this would lead to a winding down of the military campaign. Few in the movement were convinced and O'Brody was for many years a marginal figure with a small hard core of support. But his party, Republican Sinn Féin, has spotted an opportunity in the renewed ceasefire. Although still a weak and very small faction, it has recently reorganised, opening up offices in Derry and Belfast. More than a decade on, it suggests that the pragmatism of the Adams leadership has now been exposed as the final betrayal. And crucially, among the dissenters are some who until now stayed with the provisionals. The provisional policy wasn't as obvious. It was kept under wraps. The war was going on. They've given up the war. The war is over now. It's a thing of the past for the provisionals. They have nothing to offer you, anyone anymore. Speaker after speaker at the hunger strike commemoration in Bundorn condemned Sinn Féin for allegedly selling out. We in Republican Sinn Féin are now the only political organisation in Ireland working for a British withdrawal. The provisional leadership in Belfast may regard this with derision, but much more problematic is the active support the families of the 1981 hunger strikers gave to this view. The ten men who died remain political icons, and the family's presence at a Republican Sinn Féin event at such a sensitive time underscores the danger facing the provisional movement if it fails to deliver. Peggy O'Hara's son Patsy was an INLA prisoner who died before she could take him off the protest. She now believes that the provisionals have betrayed her son and questions what he died for. It died in vain, but that's the way that they're going to take us under that path. And I'm honestly, I'm speaking from my heart. I'm speaking as a mother who lost a son. And the lower mothers out there too have lost their sons. And what have we lost for nothing? That sense of unease could well present serious problems for the Adams strategy, particularly in rural areas outside the immediate control of Sinn Féin leadership. Oliver Hughes' brother Francis was another hunger striker. He maintains that the struggle was for a united Ireland, nothing less. He proclaims loyalty, but within carefully defined limits. Bottom line would be a united Ireland. Absolutely, entirely. There can be no peace or justice in Ireland under any other arrangement. Now, perhaps it will take a few years, but everything must be on the table. Everything is up for negotiation. And united Ireland is the only, only alternative. We don't want to be coming to graveyards to bury our patriot dead in years to come, in 10 years, 15 years. We have had four armed revolutions since the formation of this state. Let this be the last. But the omens are not good, and in the shadows a reinvigorated political and military machine is being created, free of any moral doubt as to the validity of continuing the armed struggle. There's no alternative to the armed struggle as long as the British stay in this country, until they give a declaration of intent to withdraw. So more lives are going to be lost? As long as the British maintain an armed force here, that's probably likely. Actions claimed by the Continuity Army Council of the IRA have been limited, but have conformed to a pattern. The bombing of the Killy Hevelin Hotel in Enniskillen was followed by an attempted car bombing campaign in Belfast and in Derry. Last May, another bomb exploded prematurely in Belfast, and during the marching season this year, shooting incidents highlighted the organization's presence even in provisional heartlands. While it doesn't have the resources to mount a sustained campaign, it clearly has the capacity to destabilize the peace process 
as it enters its most volatile stage. Spotlight understands that the continuity IRA has stepped up a recruitment drive despite warnings from the provisionals, and it's been most successful in border areas like Fermanagh, where the sense of scepticism about the move towards politics is most pronounced. Here, the conflict has always been seen in terms of nationhood denied, and the continuity IRA has become a significant force. Tony McPhillips is a Republican councillor who split with Sinn Féin in 1986. He shares much of the Republican Sinn Féin analysis, and in the recent elections topped the poll, despite a concerted campaign by Sinn Féin against him. Clearly there are organisations about, certainly in recent times, who are they were obviously prepared to continue uh, military opposition to the British presence here. Uh, if they are to continue to do that, uh, and the provisionals are prepared to follow a different path, well, yes, of course they are losing the right to, to, to claim the leadership uh, of republicanism within the six counties, or indeed on a broader basis within the 32 counties. Frank McManus is a former independent nationalist MP for Fermanagh. Now a solicitor, he has an insight into the turmoil now facing the Republican leadership. He argues that as the talks process progresses, the dangers will heighten. The real problem, I think, will emerge, strangely enough, if they do get a, a very substantial package. And then that is put to the, to the, to the people north and south in a, in a, in a referendum. Uh, if, if, it, if it falls short, significantly short, off a United Ireland, there's a really uh, serious dilemma then as to what, what attitude, what advice do they then give to the voters in a referendum in next July? And that's, that's an excruciatingly uh, painful decision for them to have to take at that time. They have done what the original free staters did in 1922 and what uh, De Valera's people did five years later and what others did down along the line. They have now found themselves in the enemy's camp, taking part with the enemy, and eventually they will be forced to defend the new position. And that means defending it against those who remain constant and who continue the struggle for a united and free Ireland. So in embracing the move towards pragmatism, the Sinn Féin leadership has laid itself open to the charge of reneging on history. Last Friday, a top-level delegation met with the Fianna Fáil-led administration in Dublin to advance the cause, in the process dragging up the ghosts of the past, with Sinn Féin suggesting that these negotiations are the most important since partition itself. History has turned full circle, and the stakes are dangerously high. Martin McGuinness was quick to claim a mandate from the Northern electorate to pursue an undiluted agenda. When we go to the negotiating table, we go there as Irish Republicans, seeking an anti-British jurisdiction in our country, seeking to bring about the right of all the people of Ireland to national self-determination and to bring about a united Ireland. And I think that if those people are prepared to give us their votes and their tens of thousands, that people like Rory O'Brien and others need to listen to them. But few observers believe a united Ireland can be achieved within this process. So the question for Sinn Féin and the IRA is can they escape their own history? This graveyard in Cross County Mayo is the final resting place of a key figure in Irish Republican history. Tom Maguire was a member of the first and second Doyle and refused to take his seat until there was a complete British withdrawal from Northern Ireland. As successive parts of the movement shifted towards constitutional politics, he bestowed his legitimacy on successive IRA campaigns. And according to the IRA's training manual, the right to wage armed struggle is based in no small part on that legitimacy. It maintains the Army Council is the direct successor to the provisional government, the first Doyle and the second Doyle. But before he died, Maguire shifted allegiance yet again, this time to Republican Sinn Féin. At his funeral, shots were fired by members of the continuity IRA. The linkage was clear. In pure doctrinal terms, the Army Council doesn't have the capacity to settle for anything less than national self-determination. Insofar as the current um, strategy and the, the leadership which is uh, carrying the strategy is seen or is, seems to be succeeding, uh, history won't become a burden, criticism won't be uh, unnecessarily damaging. But when a particular crunch arrives that it is uh, obvious 
that the present strategy, that the current strategy is either not delivering or cannot deliver, then the criticisms will have enormous import. Rory O'Brody clearly believes the conversion to politics and Sinn Féin's apparent acceptance of the triple lock safeguarding Northern Ireland's constitutional position represent not a victory but the abandonment of core principles. Any agreement is to be subjected to a majority at the talks, a majority in the six counties and a majority in the British Parliament. So clearly a free and independent Ireland is not available. For hardline Republicans, the Adams leadership is making a key mistake, for which history will exact a heavy price. The challenge facing Sinn Féin will be to keep the grassroots on side during what will be a tortuous negotiating period with an uncertain outcome. Continued action by the continuity IRA is likely to make that task much more difficult. Fernhill House, the seat of Protestant heritage in Belfast. The UVF was formed here. Its members trained in the grounds. Its guns were stored in the stables. And nearly three years ago, the combined Loyalist Military Command chose this location to announce its ceasefire. The permanence of our ceasefire will be completely dependent upon the continued cessation of all nationalist Republican violence. The sole responsibility for a return to war lies with them. Fernhill House is now a museum reflecting Protestant power and defiance. The years of certainty. The sacrifice during the First World War. And the fight to ensure Ulster remained British, whatever the cost. years ago this week, half a million loyalists took to the streets in support of Sir Edward Carson's Covenant campaign. Many of those who signed did so like this in their own blood. They pledged to use all means necessary to secure the union. As the loyalist parties participate in talks at which the very future of that union is being debated, opponents of the peace process within loyalism are echoing the past with claims of sellout and betrayal. The failure of loyalism to keep its violent extremists in check led to the death of Sean Brown in May. The 61-year-old father of six was abducted, tortured and shot. The blame has fallen on a breakaway faction of the UVF, the Loyalist Volunteer Force. The LVF definitely carried out the, the murder of Sean Brown, the leading GAA official in Balaki. Uh, that is um, both intelligence information and also on the ground the LVF wouldn't openly deny that, although they never claimed it. Sean Brown wasn't the first victim of the split within loyalism. In July 1996, as tension over the Drumcree standoff reached breaking point, members of the Mid-Ulster Brigade of the UVF, in defiance of the CLMC ceasefire, are believed to have murdered the Catholic taxi driver Michael McGoldrick near Lurgan. A year later, the same gun was used to kill 18-year-old Bernadette Martin in Ahalee, a staunchly loyalist village where the LVF is known to be active. Sources close to the organisation deny that the LVF was involved with that murder or the killing of 16-year-old James Morgan near Cloch in South Down. Nevertheless, the man charged with murdering James Morgan has sought the protection of the LVF prisoners in the maze where he's currently on remand awaiting trial. He denies the charge. Whether or not the LVF is connected to the killings, the end result is the same. Nationalists living in fear of renegade loyalists. No, there is concern because they are completely sectarian and, and select random targets for the sole purpose of instilling maximum terror into the Catholic population. And it really is the Catholic population they go for. The LVF's power base is in Mid-Ulster, specifically in the Loyalist housing estates of Portadown, where Drum Cree is very much a live issue. Billy Wright, the acknowledged leader of the LVF, played a key role during the 1996 standoff. His presence did not go unnoticed or unappreciated by Portadown loyalists, and they in turn gave him their support when the UVF threatened to kill him last year. I stand here tonight condemned to death, condemned to death in the land that I love, by the people that I love. But I know that it's for the land 
Barailos, Ulster. The Lee Wright is currently serving an eight-year jail sentence for making threats to kill, a conviction which he's appealing. He's been behind bars for six months, much of that time in solitary confinement. But despite his enforced silence, for his supporters on the outside, he remains an influential and charismatic figure, and for the loyalist political parties, a thorn in the side. Billy Wright's political analysis is on relentingly hard line. When I visited him here at the Maze recently, he firmly restated his fierce opposition to talks involving Republicans and the Irish government, while Articles 2 and 3 are still in place. And he attacked his former colleagues in the PUP, accusing them and the UDP of putting socialism before their Protestant heritage and blindly leading loyalists into a united Ireland. That view is endorsed by prominent DUP figures in Mid-Ulster. They share the analysis that the union is under threat and are openly expressing fears of a doomsday scenario. I have to be honest and say the majority of people are hoping that the political process it will succeed. But I think when push comes to shove, rather than accept a, a Dublin rule or some sort of a unitary state, then the union's people will be prepared to take whatever means is necessary to resist Dublin rule. These are people who are trying to describe what's happening in Northern Ireland in apocalyptic terms. Um, that it's the end of life as we know it in Northern Ireland, that it's one road to Dublin and, and all the rest of it. Against all the evidence, in fact. Um, but it's easy to do that. and It has always attracted a certain section of the population here. RUC sources describe the LVF as small but deadly, with some highly effective gunmen in its ranks. And there's concern that the group is recruiting members outside Mid-Ulster, in loyalist areas of counties Tyrone and Londonderry, south and north Antrim, particularly around Ballymena, capitalising on the Harryville effect. In Belfast, the UVF and UDA retain a strong grip, but defections are rumoured. The people that are being drawn to the LVF seem to be very militant and very dedicated types of people. These are types of people that have a the warped sense of honour that I had 20 years ago, where they would kill you on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, but wouldn't lift a gun on a Sunday. I don't think that they have much impact or much potential. I think that they're given more credit than what they deserve. I mean, I think that they're a very small group. Uh, they can't operate for that long because they don't have the support of the loyalist community. I mean, I think that that's qu quite evident. They don't have the support. They have small areas, you know, where they have small amounts of support. So, you know, sooner or later, it's not going to work for them. You know, sooner or later, uh, the police or the security forces will close them down. The UBS has already made its own attempts to close down the loyalist volunteer force. The Golden Hind, a bar in Portadown frequented by LVF supporters, was wrecked and set alight last month by a so-called battalion of up to 70 UVF men, following a call from the grassroots to take action against the splinter group. They know who's in control, and I think that they don't want to be taking this on. I think that they believe that their fate is against the process and against the Irish government. So I think that they want to concentrate on that, and I think that the UVF have, have you know, decided that they've flexed their muscles enough. However, senior UVF sources say that commanders regret their early indecision over how to deal with Billy Wright. Observers believe this has magnified the problem, allowing a confluence of interests to develop between fundamentalist politics and violent loyalism. I don't think that anybody now could wipe out the LVF. I think they're too big now. I think there's too much support. Uh, they're confident. The time to wipe them out if that was going to happen was when they became an entity and issued the statement of threat. One place where the LDF is certainly gaining support is in the Maze. Billy Wright was transferred here in April from Magabry, along with three other men, including former UDA Brigadier Alec Kerr, who's also under a death threat from the CLNC. There are now 27 prisoners on the LVF wing, amongst them three of the Greysteel killers. And it's understood that at least six more inmates from other jails have applied to transfer to the wing. At present, the LVF prisoners are under a punishment regime after a riot last month. A few days after that riot, shots were fired at a house on the Shankle, belonging to the man who helped broker an end to the dispute. Pastor Kenny McClinton, a former loyalist prisoner, 
believes his open criticism of the CLMC and the Loyalist Party has made him a target. Uh, uh, Kenny McClinton's wife Wendy is due to give birth within days. They've now moved to temporary accommodation in Portadown. Belfast is no longer safe. We've had to leave everything. We're now having trouble getting housed. And therefore, uh, the people that have done this on me must be very, very proud of themselves. They certainly cannot call themselves loyalists for trying to attempt to murder me. An unapologetic loyalist. Barry Bradbury, a prominent Portadown loyalist, is also living under a death threat, but it's the LVF which is targeting him. Paradoxically, he says he shares Billy Wright's political views, but was ordered out of his home and a dead kitten was left on his doorstep after he publicly criticised the LVF. I can say that the LVF have got members in their association what are drug users and drug sellers. This is something that the leaders of the Lightest Volunteer Force should be taking into hand and stopping. They are running a campaign of fear amongst the normal Protestant people. Jim, what do you say? As far as the Loyalist parties are concerned, the LVF remains an irritant, but at the grassroots, supporters admit they're struggling to keep the hardliners in check. People who, who initially who would have sought us out seeking our opinion are no longer doing that um, and it, it, they're actually avoiding contact. Who are they listening to then if they're not listening to you? Well I, I think it, they would be listening to the, the people that are, that are saying that uh, the whole process is a selling process, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it has a whole Republican agenda to it. We've been listening to all the likes of them people telling us for 25 years now that it's a selling. It, it has a whole Republican agenda to it. We've been listening to all the likes of them people telling us for 25 years now that it's a seller, that uh, we're going into our United Ireland and we're still not going into our United Ireland. The people on the ground are genuinely scared, they're genuinely sceptical. They don't know what's going to happen, but they're willing to let their four pieces so great, they're willing to go down that road as far as they can possibly go. In the short term, that nationalism, republicanism, whatever you want to call it, will be the, the, the sort of, the ones who will get the concessions. But in the long term, you know, unionism will be the winner. Despite such confidence, there's an awareness that as the talks progress, pressure will mount. There will be people on the outside who are opposed to the talks, who at certain times when we reach agreement, or when it looks like there's going to be accommodation, either on the Loyalist or Republican side, they'll let off bombs or, or they'll shoot somebody. So all the strains are going to come from outside. Uh, and while that's happening, we will have cheerleaders on the outside on both sides actually, uh, you know, cheering on and uh, trying to make sure uh, that they unnerve people. But I think, you know, what we have said and, and our strategy is, you know, that we'll make sure that, that doesn't happen in terms of being unnerved. Within hours of the Market Hill bomb, the LVF vowed to step up its terror campaign, threatening to bomb cities in the Republic. This explosion in Drogheda 11 days ago was claimed by the LVF. The Gardaí say they're keeping an open mind. As unionists join Republicans to debate the future of the Union, they know that history is strewn with fallen leaders who engaged in a compromise too far. Spotlight returns next Wednesday evening at 10.15. Next tonight on BBC One, Provost, a major new series charting the history of the IRA and Sinn Féin.